Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome. Glad to see you all this morning. How's everybody doing? This is the day that the Lord has made. Oh, that psalmist, little did he know, all these years later, it'd still be a hit, right? Well, a couple of announcements before we begin. First of all, to all of you watching us out there on our live stream, uh, wh wherever you are in the world, we ask God's blessing upon you, and we are thankful for your presence here among us today, um, even virtually. To those of you who are here in this room, isn't it going to be a beautiful day? I don't know that for sure because I haven't actually looked at the weather, but we're just deciding. It's going to be a beautiful day no matter what we, ha what we face today. A couple of announcements. Um, Many of you may have noticed uh, as you came in today that out front of the church there's a little flag that, was, that reads, um, you are loved, find your community here, Portage First United Methodist Church. Um, that flag was a gift to our congregation from United Methodist Communications. And so I hope you, um, and I hope that we, that will always be true, that people can find a loving community within the walls of this congregation. A couple other announcements, choir and bell choir are beginning their rehearsals this week. Woohoo! So Bell Choir will be meeting at 5.30 in Fellowship Hall. Chris Bailey, do you have any information you want to give to everybody? And they've asked me to call them this, so if any of you want to become a ding -a be here this Thursday at 5.30. And for those among you who like to sing, Heather, do you have any information you'd like to share? There you go. Young and old too. Young and old, it doesn't matter what, what age you are, you are invited 6.30 this week uh, for the choir practice, 5.30 for bell choir. And that is all the announcements I have for today. Uh, anyone have anything that they'd like to share? Anything that needs to be? Well, I'd like to say thank you to uh, De Pastor Deb and to her team for the wonderful community meal they had this week. Um, to Lisa, I, Lisa will be at the second service, but to Lisa who, who did all, who prepared all that food with you, and um, you had a good time, didn't you? We did. Yeah. Yeah, don't worry, Deb is fine. She's blue and purple because of the dye from the tie-dye, so we all knew she was a, secretly a child of the 60s. Well, with these things in mind, yes, thank you so much. Uh, with these things in mind, why don't we begin our worship today by listening to the prelude. Please join with me in our call to worship as you find it printed in the screen and on the in the bulletin. God stretches out the heavens and shapes the earth. 
God raises up the mountains and pours water into the seas. Come, give thanks. God calls forth plants from the soil and forms animal and infinite, animals in infinite variety. Come, give thanks. God breathes upon us and fills us with life. God gives our lives meaning through laughter and tears. Come and give thanks. God touches our hearts through family and friends. Come and worship. God loves us and blesses us with everything good. Come and worship. God loves us and overwhelms us with never-ending generosity. Come and worship. God loves us and surrounds us with love in abundance. Our first hymn this morning, Take My Life and Let It Be, number 399. Goodness, Janice, that one moved. One couldn't even tell you were formerly Lutheran. <laughs> a few announcements as we begin, a few things to, to consider as we pray today. Our sister church, Michigan City UMC, um, will be, uh, is, is having their second Sunday at Rittenhouse um, this Sunday. That's where they're going to be meeting throughout their, their as their building is shut down. Um, they're going to continue to worship at Rittenhouse in Michigan City. Um, which again they said was great because half their shut-ins were already there. So um, they are waiting to hear back um, regarding what, what the toxicology report says about their building. Um, but they're very, very excited uh, because next Sunday they are having a baptism. Many of you will remember a couple years ago we prayed for baby Jesse. Uh, baby Jesse came into this world with a lot of illnesses and a lot of difficulties and heart and Immediately, as soon as he was born, was having surgeries. Well, baby Jesse is well enough that he's going to be baptized that Sunday along with his father. So. so as Pastor Nancy told me this morning, we don't have a building, but we're still very much the church. Um, I'd like prayers today. I have a friend. His name is Michael. Um, no, this isn't a veil. This isn't me. I do have another friend named Michael. 
Um, my friend is dealing with a drug addiction. He just left rehab this week. Um, please pray for Michael and all those dealing with addiction. Many of you have asked about Tom Ellison. Um, he's home. Uh, he's under hospice care. He's very much enjoying sitting outside and watching the cars go by. Um, Chris, went, I'm, I'm planning to go see him tomorrow, but Chris went to see him last week, so she's got a little more information, but she said um, they had a really nice conversation. Oh, Connie, hi. <laughs> Hello, my love, how are you? You doing okay this morning? I'm glad to have you this morning. How, how are things going? Well, we're so, yeah, so happy about that. And um, he's thankful. He's really doing well, you know, considering. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has his moments, and <laughs> so do I. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to see you here this morning, and we're continuing to pray for you. Yeah, welcome, yeah, and welcome home to you as well. Uh, finally, I've, uh, Karen Blakely has mentioned to us that Chuck Lorenz has been having some difficulty breathing, um, so please continue to remember Chuck in your prayers. I had scheduled a meeting to visit him this week, and um, he canceled, so um, hopefully I can go and see him this week. But please pray for Chuck. If you need more information, I bet Wanda has it. I bet Wanda has heard from him at some point where to Wanda go. See, I'm losing them all. There are they. Uh, there she is. So uh, if you'd like some more information about that, please ask Wanda. Um, with these things in mind, I also wanted to remind you that today is Labor Day, a holiday created in America to honor uh, the worker and the American worker, and specifically everything that they do to make our lives uh, better from day to day. Um, so with these things in mind, let us be in prayer. Oh God, you have bound us together in this life. Give us grace to understand how our lives depend on the courage, the industry, the honesty, and the integrity of all who labor. May we be ever mindful of their needs, grateful for their faithfulness, and faithful in our responsibilities to them through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We are thankful and we pray a blessing upon all those that lay their task to a job or a vocation. We pray for all those who, wherever they are, are laboring to make equity and appropriate pay and appropriate safety um, concerns of both uh, of industry. We pray for all those who teach and who, who uh, train, praying that they do their job diligently and well so that safety and well-being of workers continues to be paramount. We pray for all those who seek work, praying that you help them to find the job that is best for them, that will help them support themselves and their families and their loved ones. Gracious one, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up to you all those persons who have no home today. We pray for the homeless. We pray even for our sister church, Michigan City, that is meeting in diaspora today. We pray for their continued well-being and pray a prayer of thanks that they are still very much the church. We lift up to you all those persons dealing with the disease of addiction, especially we pray for Michael. We lift up to you all those who are being translated into that better language of love and are slowly moving away from this mortal coil, especially we lift up to you, Tom. We pray and lift up to you all of our shut-ins Wherever they are, may they know the love of Christ. May you be present with them. We lift up to you, especially our brother Chuck. Gracious one, you hear our prayers, and you know our needs before we ask. And so for all that Christ has done for us, we are truly thankful. We pray that Christ will be present in our world to the end that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so, Lord, in praise of Christ, we offer to you the prayer he taught us, saying, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Our first reading this morning comes from one of the more controversial books of the Bible, the book of James. And there was a lot of discussion uh, around the year 300 um, when the Bible was being formed together. There was a lot of discussion about whether James needed to be included. Um, But it's here for us today. So let's read from James chapter 1. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and fearless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Our next hymn is number 410, I Want a Principle Within.
In the interest of time, we'll forego the children's message today and move on to our mission moment. Who has our mission moment today? Hi, Lee. Good morning, church family. I'll try and be quick today. Um, we're into September. Uh, as I said last week, towards the end of the month, we're going to be passing out the shopping bags and uh, help stop out hunger by collecting food for the food pantry. Also, after the service, Connie will be selling these coupon books, which They've got a lot of nice stuff in there. I've already saved $10 on the $20 coupon book, and it's still good for another year and a few months. So <laughs> you can really save some money with this one. Um, so Connie will be at the Welcome Center after service selling these for $20. So, um, and don't forget the Haunted Hayride coming up in October. I have a basket out there for the um, trunk or treat. So if you bring in candy, you can just stick it in the basket out on that little wooden table outside the door. Okay, thank you. The coupon books are for Family Promise, which um, are for homeless families. So, okay, thank you. From the Gospel of St. Mark, the Roman, hear these words. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that, was, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews who do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they can't come to the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, uh, unless they wash and they observe many other traditions, such as washing of cups and pitchers and, and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are merely human rules. They have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from the inside and defile a person. This is the word of God for the people of God. have a seat. Well, I'm going to tell you today about a person uh, who was once in my life. Um, they were a colleague of mine. I'm not going to tell you their names because I tell you this today that this story is not terribly flattering. And it never was. 
you ever meet somebody and they tell you who they are in the first five minutes of meeting? I always say if somebody's going to tell you who they are, um, the least you can do is believe them. And it just so happened that when I was commissioned into ministry, now here's how this works. Um, after seminary and you go through your first round of interviews, you're commissioned, which is the first time the bishop lays hands on you and you're put into a three-year residency where they watch you and they look over you. And if you do okay in your residency, you're fully ordained, right? And so in order to get there, um, you have to do all these psychological evaluations. I'm not crazy. Um, and uh, you have to do all, fill out all this paperwork and you have to do all this stuff and you have to have all these interviews. And the moment comes when you're going to be commissioned. And in order to do that, at the annual conference, um, they have what's called executive session or clergy session. And that's when the, the doors are closed to all you lay, lay people. And, uh, and they come in and they introduce you and they tell who you, this is Michael. His home church was Frankton First Name of this church. He went to Ball State University. He's seeking to be commissioned this year in ministry. Let's all vote. Should we let Michael be a minister? Now, in some ways, it's a foregone conclusion because you've already met with the Board of Ordained Ministry. But, but, you know, the rules are the rules. And in order to be welcomed into an order of ministry, the entire order has to vote. And so at this is the moment when they, someone can say, I don't think he should, right? The whole room gets, gets to say whether or not they, they want this to happen. And so what happens is that they... They introduce you and then they send you from the room out into the hallway. So I was with a group of people being commissioned and just down the way a little bit were those who, were, who had made it through their residency and were now seeking to be fully ordained, right? Once you're ordained, you're always a minister. It's the only way, there's only a couple ways you can leave it, right? You're, once the, the bishop lays hands on you as an ordination, it's always on you for the rest of your life, all throughout eternity. And so... We're sitting there and, and there are all these chairs in the hallway that we're supposed to sit on while they're inside voting and talking about each one of us, right? And so, we, so I sit down in a chair and then I notice that there's a gentleman standing there and uh, he's, he's sort of standing there and I'm like, because I, was, I, I had home raising, as my mom would put it, since I had home raising, I was like, oh, sir, would you like this chair? You know, offering it to him, right? And he goes, no. I would rather stand with the elders. Well, you go right ahead. <laughs> and I knew exactly who he was. From that moment on, I knew exactly who he was, what he was, what he was about. I knew it, and I was right, too. A couple years later, the annual conference was meeting, and we were voting on delegates to go to the general conference. And as an elder, he was eligible. Not only did he feel like he was eligible, he felt like he was a perfect choice. And he made sure everybody knew that he thought he was a perfect choice. And um, because people had met him, they didn't vote on him. They didn't vote for him. And uh, so he went home and he got on Facebook and he started complaining uh, to every, you know, complaining for days about how he had his conservative credentials and he was ready to become, he was ready to be a delegate and he can't believe that they didn't vote for him and, and how he's just so upset with, with the people that he works with and with his caucus and he, he's just so mad at them and all these kinds of things. And he, then he started talking about all the, the issues that he had with the annual conference and our bishop and, and put them all on Facebook and, and just, you know, you know how they say, Dirty laundry doesn't belong in your living room. Dirty laundry, friends, also does not belong on Facebook, all right? But he just laid everybody out to dry. And so guess what? The next year, the annual conference wrote its social media policy for the first time, all because of this guy, right? <laughs> and so I, I watched him implode online, and then he unfriended me and several other, and, and everyone who wasn't in his closest circle, because that way he could complain loudly without everyone knowing. And I, he and I were not like friends or anything. I just, just kind of a person that I knew. Years later, he was positioned at a church and he'd kind of gone from a rising star in the annual conference to let's just stick him somewhere. 
because we have to, because he, he's in good standing, so we have to give him a church. Where can we put him that he's not going to cause too much trouble? And so they sent him to a small congregation just outside Indianapolis. The reason that it was so close to Indianapolis is because it was also close to the conference office, and they could call him in every so often. You know these people. I don't care what your job is. You know these people, don't you? You've met these people before. I don't care what your job is. You've got somebody in, in your realm who's like this, right? I don't care what your job is. You've met these people, right? So, he start, so he's serving this church, and as he's leaving the current, his current church, this large, tall, steeple church, he stands in the pulpit, and this is where it really gets bad for me. He stands in the pulpit and says, well, my wife and I have decided that we're not going to, to live in a parsonage anymore. We're going to, uh, we're going to, to buy our own home, and, um, and that's going to be, it's very important to us for our family and for our family's well-being. And we don't, you know, we, we don't have the money for the down payment, but we just know God is going to provide. Now, you all know what happened, don't you? That loving congregation dug deep and paid for the down payment for his house, right? Because they're loving Christian people. And I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure that he had done many, I'm sure he had sat at their bedsides, I'm sure he'd done many of the things that pastors do. And so they wanted to show their love. So they paid for the down payment for his house. When I heard this, I thought, what a wonderful congregation and what a horrible, horrible man to use his congregation's love for him to cash in. As years went on, right, um, he eventually became one of those pastors that, uh, that turned in his credentials, that left, the church, that left the United Methodist Church and joined the WCA. <laughs> they can have him. Um, <laughs> They left and he joined the WCA, and then he started contacting his previous churches, trying to get them to leave the denomination, right? And um, one of those congregations happens to be, you know, led by one of, my, one of my dear friends, and she said, he's written about it several times, and he wrote, I'm just so disappointed in this congregation. They decided to remain United Methodist, and then he said, they just never really got me. Excuse me? What, what, are you, what, what? They never got you? Why are you so important? What, what about their mission in the name of Jesus Christ? What about Jesus? Isn't that the most important thing? Isn't that the most important question, right? And I tell you all this today because we have Jesus and he's talking to this kind of religious leader, right? Jesus is having a conversation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law of Moses. And at this point in, in history, the Pharisees and the Sadducees have the law, but they've also added a lot of traditions around the law because they're trying so hard to fulfill all of its requirements. And so what's mentioned here is that Jesus and his disciples, who are all rather blue-collar working men, fishermen, you know, those kinds of things, they're not, they're not erudite religious leaders, right? They're eating food having not washed their hands ceremonially. This doesn't mean that their hands were dirty. It means that in the eyes of the Pharisees, their hands were not clean. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a lot of rules about how you were to clean, cleanse your hands before uh, you were to eat. Now, this isn't just the thing where you wash under your fingernails and between your fingers and wash the thumb separately, that thing that we did during COVID that we should still be doing because it's a good practice. No, there's sort of a ceremonial sort of thing that happens where first you wash your hands and then you bless your hands with the water. And once your hands are, are, have gone through all this sort of ceremonial kind of, kind of stuff, then you can eat. And that's all well and good for people who are aristocrats and all well and good for people who are Pharisees and, and, and erudite and, and all of these magnificent leaders. But most of the working people, most of the common people, just washed their hands. They just washed their hands and ate. And so they're sitting there saying, you're supposed to be religious people. And here you are, and you're not ceremonially washing your hands. You're not, you're not doing all the things that the elders have said that we need to do in order to get our hands clean. Oh, tisk tisk. Oh, you're just, oh, you're just not really, really committed. You're just not really committed. You're just, 
you're just going along. Oh, you're, you're just becoming worldly. And Jesus says to them, well, you know, Isaiah spoke about you. He said that there would be hypocrites like you one day that are so interested in human laws and, and, and issues that they're just, they've missed the entire point. One of the major themes of Jesus' preaching is that it's not always about what you do. It's about where it comes from, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees would say, I've never committed murder. I've never killed anyone. Therefore, I'm not guilty of murder. But Jesus says, if you've thought about it for a long time, if you've thought about murder, if you've like sort of entertained that and thought about what it would be like, you've pretty much already done it in your heart. That for Jesus, it wasn't just always about what you did or what you accomplished. It was about what was going on in here. That the law wasn't just about what you don't do. It's about what's going on inside of you. And Jesus says, in fact, it's, it's the inside of you that really becomes what happens outside of you. If you and, and as we read in the text, as we read very clearly in the text today, he says... Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, every slander, arrogance, and folly, all these evils come from the inside, and they're the things that defile a person. Jesus takes the law, and he says it's, not, it's never been. It's never been about just what you do. It's about who you are and who you are on the inside. All of a sudden, the battle becomes much, much more difficult. I mean, let's face it, um, you know, we, we have, most of us probably haven't murdered someone uh, in this room, uh, most of us, I think, um, and most of us haven't murdered because there are lots of repercussions for that, aren't there? There's jail time and investigations and all of those things. There are a lot of societal things that are saying, don't murder because then you'll get in trouble, right? And that's a very good reason not to murder, right? It's a very, very good reason. I, I think we should continue that trend. I want to endorse that. I know we're not supposed to be political, but I think laws against murder are really great. I think we should keep them, right? But there's this reality here that Jesus says, but it's what goes on inside you that makes you just as guilty. This is not about painting people with sin. This is the reality that it's in your heart that all of this stuff begins. It's in who you are and what you think. And I have to admit, there have been times in my life that I'm guilty of murder. There have been moments that I thought about it. I thought about it when I heard the story of that pastor standing in the pulpit and thought, man, it'd be, feel really good to just punch him in the nose and hear the crunch. <laughs> I'm very serious. I thought about it. I've prayed about it. I've repented of it. And yet there are moments that the thought comes back. Right? <laughs> and there are moments that I have to sit there and say, God, this person on the inside is not a good person sometimes, and God, I shouldn't be feeling these feelings of violence, and, and I shouldn't be endorsing and, and, and feeling these feelings of violence in my heart, but Lord, they're there. And I know, I know because I've read the scriptures that I am not alone in this. How many times does a psalmist say to God, Oh, Lord, how marvelous are your works, how beautiful your things, I, I, and Lord, my enemies, I hate them. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I wish you could even with my enemies. Do you see them down there, Lord? Oh, take care of them, Lord. From the beautiful heavens, Lord, take care of them. Hurt them, hurt them, Lord. How many times? Because that is what life with God is like, isn't it? This, this strange mixture of, of who I want to be and who I am. I want to praise God one moment and the next moment I'm ready to just endorse and feel violence. The Psalms put me face to face with myself. Put me in, the, in front of that mirror and say, look, look at the violence in your heart. Look at the moments you praise God. Look at the moments you curse God. Look at who you really are. Jesus moves the law from some external thing and says, no, it's about who you are on the inside who you became, who it is that's, that's moving you and motivating you. It's about, and that, and from that well is where your, your actions come from. I don't know about you all, but sometimes I feel like there's a great battle in the mind. Sometimes I feel like, like I don't even recognize myself sometimes. 
I don't think most of the time I'm a violent person. I don't think most of the time that I'm a hateful person. But there are moments that I just find myself going down a road in my mind and in my heart that just isn't right and it doesn't belong. I had a wonderful spiritual teacher named Peg Hutchins tell me something uh, that made it very, very, it, it was very helpful. And so I thought I would share it with you today. She was talking about what happens in our minds and in our hearts and, and when we let, try, are led down to, to when we're led down the, the path of violence, or even those moments when we don't want to forgive someone, you know, um, you're just angry with them and you don't want to forgive them. And she says, here's what you can do. In your prayers, say to God, God, I don't want to forgive such and such, but I want to want to forgive. Help me get my will in line with yours. Help me get my will in line with yours. And when we start looking at God's will, well, we start seeing the challenge, don't we? Because even though God has a lot of things he can be mad at us for, we're still alive. Even though God has a lot of things he could seek revenge on us for, up to and including the death of his only begotten son, God still says to us from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God's will, apparently, is not violence against us. God's will is to save us, and because of that, he's had to make some very difficult, difficult decisions. But if Jesus teaches us nothing, it teaches us that God's will is that we should be saved and not lost. God has had to make some difficult decisions to get us there, to get us to that moment but now that he has done so, we find ourselves needing to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Well, let me tell you, just because I bet you're interested, um, this, the end of the story so far as I'm concerned with this other pastor. I hadn't talked to him, hadn't heard from him in years, wasn't interested. And all of a sudden, one day, I get an email sent it to everyone in the annual conference, everyone he knew. And it had this long diatribe about how we need to push our churches to leave the denomination and how if we have not presented uh, that leaving the denomination and if we are supporting LGBTQ plus persons in our churches, then we are, then we are dear elect in our duty and we are failing as ministers. And, um, that, that, and here is his new email. Um, in case we want to keep in touch with him, and he, here, he, and he's, he, you know, of course, he's losing his conference email because he's not part of the conference anymore. So here's his new email address. Here's his new phone number, and I wrote back. <laughs> I haven't written back in a long time, and I said simply, "Thank you for informing me of your new email address and your new phone number. However, you may now remove me from your mailing list because I can think of no." A situation in which I'd ever want to talk to you again. And then I sent that to him. Note that it was free of revenge. Note that I didn't read him one side or the other. Note that I didn't argue with him or fight with him or indulge in violence. I just put an end, a boundary line. No thank you. I don't want to talk to you anymore. I don't want you in my life. I would like to tell you that that's because I am a holy person. I would like to tell you that that's because I am a kind and generous soul. But it's not true. It's because I deleted four other emails. <laughs> because God kept saying, nope, no, no, do not get, no, no. Oh, wow, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> See, it's just a memory now. No, Michael, no. I had to want to want God's will. I didn't want God's will, I'll be honest. <laughs> but I had to want to want God's will. So in the battlefield of the mind and of the heart, know, number one, that it's where everything stems from, right? It's where everything comes from. It's what's in here is what does it all, right? What happens out there in the world starts right here. 
and know that in the battle of right here, number one, you're not perfect. Number two, you're not alone. I really shouldn't have been my foot like that. <laughs> the time has come for the giving of our tithes and offerings, and Jesus our Lord is teaching us that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Gracious and mighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, upon this congregation, and upon the gifts upon the altar, that in everything we are we may be, we may be nourished through Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. You'll open up your hymnals to page number 15. We'll begin our liturgy for communion. All of a sudden, I feel incorrect. It is 15 that says the great thanksgiving, correct? That's what you're looking for. Oh, page 13 then. I apologize. As soon as I said it, it felt wrong. Begins with the Lord be with you. All right. Well, then the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for the day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, saying, Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup and said, This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit in your Holy Church, All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Can I have your help? Can I have you and Randy?
Gracious Lord, beneath the veil of the sacrament, we find ourselves nourished. For indeed, it is your presence we feast upon. Thank you for being present in the bread and the wine and present in our lives. Help us to be worthy of the calling to which we have been called. Amen. Our final hymn, For the Fruits of Creation, number 97. <laughs> so, 